Hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, this video is just gonna be a brief overview of some different ways to approach research. And again, it's just meant to give you start into the way that research scientists think about how to go about uh, looking at their phenomenon of interest. So the first thing to note is that research always begins with the question. Um, and this seems obvious, except that there's a lot of cases, particularly in industry, where people come at you with a technology, a method, a gadget, uh, and they want you to figure out what to do with it. And that's really not impressive. Um, if you're thinking about getting grants, uh, you have to kind of suggest what the problem is before you suggest what the solution is. So you have to know what you're asking. And uh, before we get into the specifics of any particular research, there are just some general things about research in general, and particularly in psychological research that you want to address. So let's talk about a couple of these general questions. The first involves, what are we trying to do? And there's two kind of versions of this. Are we trying to explain behavior? Uh, and this is, do we want to know why people are doing things? Or are we just trying to describe what's happening in, in your particular sample? Uh, and those are different. Uh, and you can think about them as the blue is a why, and the red is a what. <laughs> So are you trying to explain why people do things or are you trying to explain what people are doing? Secondary to that, once you answer that question, the next level is what are we interested in doing? Are we interested in controlling behavior? That is, do we want to eventually be able to influence what people are doing? Or are we interested in predicting, not necessarily controlling, but at least having a good idea about what's happening? And you can think about this as a difference from say, say the blue might be advertising um, and the red might be polling and politics. So the idea of advertising is that you're trying to influence a behavior, trying to get people to do a particular thing. So you're doing things, you're manipulating things that will hopefully guide the behavior in a particular direction. In polling, what you're trying to do is get an understanding of, based on the demographics of the people, what things are there are important to them so that you can use that to kind of predict what things are likely to vote for or against or who they might be vote for who or against, and then use that information to uh, help further, say, a candidate's campaign. So, explain, describe, control, or predict. Those are the kind of levels that are coming in. The next thing is what do we do in that, need that data to look like? Do we need it to be precise? That is something that's repeatable, something that is pretty specific. Or do we need it to be relevant? That is, do we need it to actually reflect what's happening? Uh, and again, those, those will just depend on what you're looking for. Once we ask these questions, then we can drill a little further down the data and figure out what kind of data are we trying to get? Are we looking at magnitude? That is how much? Or are we looking at pattern? That is things that are th the things that repeat? Are we looking at frequency? How often does something happen? Or are we looking at structure? That is, what is the, what's the form does something take? And the way to think about these is that the ones in yellow are uh, amount questions. That is, how much of something exists? The ones in green are what kind of things are happening. Uh, so again, these are these are different questions and I got them grouped like this kind of specifically and you'll see why in a second. So once you address these things, there are methodologies that kind of map onto these, that, that kind of are good at certain types of questions uh, and less good at other types. And no, nothing's totally bad, but there are better choices. So our, there's three general kind of categories that we can lump things in. So depending on your answers to the questions in the last slide, uh, things can either be <clears throat> quantitative as your method, qualitative as your method, or a third category, which is quasi-experimental, which has traits of both quantitative and qualitative. And you can see the things here that uh, suggest when you would use these particular type of uh, techniques. And what you see is that in the blue here on this side, this is what we talked about in the blue on the other side. On this side in yellow is what was in the red. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the kind of questions uh, that were being asked there. So quasi-experimental kind of is a blend of those where you kind of get, have data that you can't necessarily, or a phenomenon that you can't control, but it, you can still quantify. So that's kind of that middle ground. So when would you use these? It wouldn't be a good choice to use quali quantitative versus qualitative versus quasi-experimental. Well. Uh, quantitative, which is typically is experimentation, is great when you have specific hypotheses. That is, you've got a very specific question, you kind of know what you're looking for. When the, uh, the sample that you're looking at is pretty similar uh, and behave in similar ways or have similar traits. 
Uh, and when the things you're looking at can be quantified, that is you can put a number on them uh, for that. And there are also things that operate really well under controlled conditions. And qualitative, this is when you're just trying to figure out what's there. This might be more general and just more broad questions. The phenomena you might be interested in are complex and don't really lend themselves into very simple categories. Um, and you can't really put a number on it. Some, there might be things that they just they just don't lend themselves to putting on a number scale from that. Quasi-experimental is kind of the middle of that, where there's aspects of quantitative that you want and there's aspects of qualitative that you want. And quanti quasi-experimental is typically done in field research where you can't necessarily control everything, but there are things that you can rein in. So it gives you, in some ways, either best of both worlds or you know, it's, it does neither thing really, really well, but it gets the job done, uh, just depending on how you think about it. Now, if you are have these slides at home, you can click on the little smaller circles to get more information. I will click on them just to show you what the take home point for each one of these is. So for observation, which be our uh, sort of the first step, I think, in any research, but often tends to be qualitative. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff here that you can look at, and this you'll get more of this as you get more into the major. Uh, this is especially useful if you're studying complex situations or when you don't know a whole lot about a phenomenon. The worst thing you can do if you don't know what's going on is just start manipulating stuff at random. Uh, who knows what you'll get? So observation or qualitative stuff, I think, is always a great first step. It establishes what's there. Um, this design is great because it looks at behavior over time. It can give you kind of patterns over time. You can see what kind of things are regular, what kind of things are unique. And then you can take that information and then formulate more quantitative questions about it if you'd like. Um, it is not meant to reveal causes. That's not what this design is for. It's meant to reflect what's there. It's meant to just describe the situation as it unfolds. And that can be a powerful thing as you'll find out as you go through the field. Quasi-experimental, which is our middle child, if you will, again, shares traits from both. And the, the key thing here is that there's situations where if you apply control, it changes the phenomenon or that you just don't have that ability. So if you're in a workplace setting, you can't randomly change people's jobs around for that. So there's some lack of control, but you also can manipulate other things. This type of design is useful. Um, when you're out in the field, when you're out in the real world. Uh, and because a lot of times you're under constraints where you can't control certain factors. Like for instance, if you're doing educational research, you can't control who's in what classroom or who's teaching what subject. Those things are already set in place. But within those things, you can manipulate other factors. Um, the one kind of downside to this is it is prone to confounds. And what confounds are, are things that can influence your data outside of the things that you meant to influence your data. So you do some, certain things in purpose in a study. Confounds are the things that aren't in purpose, but also affect your data. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the methodology that you're going to learn in this major is how to separate those things out or how to lessen the effect of these confounds. The plus side is that because you're doing this in the field, because you're not controlling it, it actually reflects what's going on. So you can say, in this setting, this is how people actually behave. Uh, that's one thing that is always kind of the cautionary tale when we do experimentation. So let's talk about that. So long list of things over here, uh, just talks about the traits of it. But the thing I want you to sort of take home with is that this is the one type of design that allows you to talk about cause. It allows you to talk about why. And it's because you're controlling both the things that are happening and the characteristics of the people or sample that are in the study. So you're, you're controlling both aspects. That control on both sides gives you the ability to talk about cause in a way that you can't with the other designs. Um, it does mean that the behavior or the outcomes that you get are specific to that situation. So the plus side is repeatable. It's something that you can do over and over again. You can get consistent results. That's always important in science, but it may not reflect how people actually do things. So that's the thing you have to weigh out. And it's, it's kind of kind of a, a game, a balancing game of how you figure these things out. So how do we, address this thing? How do, how do we figure out which way we should go with this? So that's a question that we all ask, and I still ask that. I'm 20 years in and I still ask it. And what I've found uh, is that it depends on a couple of things. The first is what you were asking. So that first slide, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? The second is where and how are you collecting your data? That will also determine what kind of methodology you use. The third is 
what kind of answer do you need? What do you need that information? Once you have it, what's it going to be used for? And what you'll find, and you know, I think what a lot of people find surprising is that often the questions that you have require using multiple methods. And at one point you might be quantitative, another part you might be qualitative, another part you might be quasi-experimental, and you can move back and forth between those depending on where your, your work lies. Uh, and I've done that myself. I've done laboratory research that's turned into applied settings, that's turned back to laboratory research. Um, and it, it's, it's a, a fun journey trying to figure that out and get the best answer for that. And so ultimately, the best tool you have is you. Um, being a thinking psychologist or thinking scientist, uh, critically thinking, examining factors, making good decisions about the research process, that's the best tool you have. Not the technology, not the software, not some gadgetry. Uh, it's your mind that is your best tool in this process. So this is just meant to give you a quick kind of peek into the different ways you can approach research. Um, we'll learn more about that as you go through the major. Uh, and I hope you found this useful. And I will see you guys on the next round. Take care, everyone.